everybody and welcome to this session on a, an introduction to accessible communications. My name is Kel Bix, my pronouns are they, them, and I am the Accessible Document Quality Assessor with the Public Library Services Branch in the Municipal Services Division of Municipal Affairs. With me today is uh, Kim Johnson, she, her, who is the Accessibility Team Lead in the Public Library Services Branch, um, and she will be helping with the PowerPoint presentation and doing some demonstrations as well. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we are a part of the accessibility team within the Public Library Services branch. There are um, several aspects to this team and one of the main ones is training. Um, on accessible documents, the creation of accessible documents. We train Alberta Public Service um, staff as well as stakeholders on uh, making documents, um, social media, uh, PowerPoint presentations, et cetera, accessible. Um, I am, as I mentioned, the Accessible Document Quality Assessor, and my main job is to look at already existing documents and assess them for accessibility. I review documents, websites, social media, etc. for accessibility, and I share um, tips and accessibility best practices with those document or website creators. I have looked at a lot of websites, social media, accounts, um, documents in my work, and I have found that a lot of communications um, are not accessible. And so today I'm going to offer a few tips and tricks on how to make communications more accessible for those with disabilities. And I will get into what print disabilities are momentarily. Next slide, please. OK, so disabilities in Canada. Approximately 6.2 million Canadians, or one in five people, identify as having a disability. 1.5 million Canadians have a visual disability. Just over 1 million Canadians identify as having a learning disability, and nearly 2.7 million Canadians identify as having a mobility disability. Next slide, please. So print disabilities. The Canadian Copyright Act defines print disabilities as an impairment that prevents someone from reading traditional print formats and can affect those with visual, cognitive, and mobility impairments. Um, as many as one in 10 Canadians may qualify as having a disability. Um, print disabilities are something that co-occur with another disability, such as a visual disability, a mobility disability, et cetera. So um, they are something that you may have with another disability, th though um, if you have a disability, you may not have a print disability. And many print disabilities are invisible, and so you may not know that somebody has a print disability unless they disclose that to you. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, visual disabilities. Visually impairments may prevent someone from seeing text. And this may include blindness, low vision, cataracts, and macular de degeneration, and extreme light sensitivity. I myself have a print disability. I am blind. I was born blind with a genetic condition that affects my retinas, which resulted in a severe visual impairment from birth. And so I have a print disability. Um, print is difficult for me to read. Um, for me to be able to read it, it needs to be about size font size 100 to 115. Um, so I um, need to rely on assistive technology and the um, ability to read in other ways. Uh, next slide, please. So mobility disabilities. Mobility impairments may prevent someone from phys physically manipulating a document, such as turning pages or using a mouse. 
Um, examples of this include Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, uh, spinal cord injury, or arthritis. Uh, next slide, please. So cognitive disabilities. Cognitive impairments may prevent someone from perceiving text, and examples of this include dyslexia, a stroke, aphasia, and dementia. Uh, next slide, please. So um, many people with print disabilities rely on assistive technology in order to read. And so I'm going to show a few demo videos on different types of assistive technology. And these demonstration videos uh, were created for our training that we do on accessible Microsoft Word documents. So there will be mentions in those videos about accessibility in Microsoft Word, but they are uh, very good demonstrations of different types of assistive technology. And so the first video will uh, be about screen readers. Screen readers are programs that speak aloud text and other visual information from all areas of a device. They offer full keyboard control of the device instead of a mouse. Essentially, a screen reader acts as an interface between a device's operating system and programs and the screen reader user. It interprets and conveys essential visual information through synthesized speech output. In a moment, you will hear me use a screen reader called JAWS, standing for Job Access with Speech, to read text in this document. With a screen reader, one can navigate by character. B E C O M I N G space. Word. A system member blank. Line. Regional library systems provide their members with a variety of services which may include dedicated consultants, technical support, collection development assistance, and training the systems also. And continuously. Regional library systems provide their members with a variety of services which may include dedicated consultants, technical support, collection development assistance, and training the systems also distribute the public library network services provided by the province to its member libraries. Front appointment. Change the rate of speech. Faster, 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 faster. Slower, 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 slower. And receive information about visuals such as font. 11 point, black on white, aerial, normal style, line spacing, colon, at least 12 points, paragraph formatting, colon, aligned left, outline level, colon, body text. A screen reader can interact with programs such as Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and web browsers. However, screen readers can't read or interact with some applications or elements of documents unless the document or application's creator enacts some accessibility considerations. For instance, here is an inaccessible PDF file. Inaccessible PDF .pdf. JAWS can't read the text in this PDF because it is a scanned image. Alert colon empty document. However, here is that same PDF but it is readable with JAWS because the creator applied a few simple steps when saving the document from Word. Add tabs container view. A fact sheet for Alberta Public Library boards and councils. Front face of rural public library in winter. Library has white siding and brown brick columns with the word library written along the top of the building. Graphic. Graphic. Heading level one becoming a system member. Regional library systems provide their members with a variety of services, which may include dedicated consultants, technical support, collection development, assistance, and training. The systems also distribute the public library network services provided by the province. Throughout this accessible document resource, you will learn how to add changes to your workflow that will make your documents accessible for those who rely on assistive technologies like screen readers. OK, so that was a brief overview of what screen reading technology is and how it looks and sounds like. And so next there, I will show you a brief video on refreshable Braille displays. You are 
most likely familiar with Braille as a concept. It is a system of raised dots that some blind people read with their fingers. Braille is made up of groups of six dots called cells. Cells consist of two columns and three rows. Dots in these columns and rows are either raised or lowered in specific patterns to represent print symbols, including letters, numbers, punctuation, music notation, and mathematic and scientific symbols. Hard copy Braille can be quite bulky. For instance, these two large volumes of Braille are about six inches thick and are the Braille version of this average sized novel that is about three quarters of an inch thick. A refreshable Braille display is essentially a portable display that connects to a computer, phone, or tablet using Bluetooth or USB connectivity and presents the information a screen reader speaks in Braille for tactile reading. This functionality allows the user to engage with the information a screen reader speaks on a more tactile level, thus, for instance, enabling one to edit for errors a screen reader may not clearly articulate, such as extra spaces between words or confused homophones. The Braille display also can enable one to become more aware of the formatting of a text, and some users may prefer to read Braille instead of listening to a synthesized voice uh, from a screen reader. As well, Deafblind people may mute the speech from their screen reader and interact with their device entirely through a Braille display. Braille displays require a compatible screen reader to be running on a device that translates and converts the information it speaks out loud into Braille code so that the Braille display can then display it using pins that move up and down to form the Braille characters. This is a Mantis Q40 Braille display. It has a QWERTY keyboard on the top of the front face of the device and a 40 cell braille display at the bottom. The keyboard allows me to control my computer completely from the display. Some braille displays also have internal storage so one can save an electronic braille file containing a document or a book to the device for a portable and much more compact reading experience than reading and car carrying around many large volumes of Braille. All right, so that was a demonstration of refreshable Braille displays. And the last demonstration that I'm going to show you for this part of the presentation on assistive technologies is about screen enhancement software. And this video was created by my colleague, Camelia Campbell. And so we will play that now. giving a demonstration of how ZoomText works on a computer. So once this software is downloaded, it serves two main functions as the magnifier and the voice reader. So with the magnifier, the voice is on and you can uh, play, talk, play around with all of these settings using your keyboard, which is what I'll be doing throughout this video. So first, I just want to get to some settings. As you can see on the screen here, the cursor has a red circle around it. That's because having a circle or some type of identifier uh, by the cursor helps me um, find it because it can get lost on the screen easily. Also, you can change the color, color enhancements enabled. Change the color contrast to black on black, black on white instead of color, color enhancements disabled. But I'm going to change it to a normal setting. Um, and for the magnifier, you can increase 1.4. 1.6, 1 1.8, 2, 2.25, 4, 4.5, 5. 5, and it goes all the way up to 60. So as you see, once you magnify it in, the screen gets smaller. So you only see chunks of the screen at a time. And that's why when we're using Microsoft Word, the navigation pane becomes in handy because One. this navigation pane helps give structure to the document. So I'm going to magnify my screen in. 1.8, 2, 3. I'm going to minimize the Zoom text interface. And well, let's look how much pages. In this document, there are 51 pages. So without having um, structure, by having headings in the document, if I wanted to get to a specific section of this Personal page. Personal painting of the Alberta legislature ground. 
voice disabled. I'm going to turn the voice off for a moment. Um, I would have to scroll with my mouse, table of contents, security 101, the basics. So as you can imagine, that can take a long time to get to somewhere specifically. So if we go over to the navigation pane and click on the headings, this document has been remediated. Therefore, it has um, the proper accessibility considerations and headings. I can click on the heading or subheading directly. This heading level one um, says work, uh, workplace violence. If I click on that, instead of having to scroll, I can, it will bring me directly to the page. So headings are great. Um, for structure, organization, and saves a lot of time. So someone like me who needs the print extremely large, I don't have to scroll through all of the information. So those are headings, which are great. And next I'm going to talk about images with long descriptions. So in this document, if we go down to page number, 46. Here there is an infographic and when I toggle out you can also toggle in and out, magnify all the way out so you get a full view of the screen. There is a infographic that is quite complex image and if I magnify in I only see one section of the picture at the time so this makes may make it difficult for me um, to understand fully what this picture is trying to convey. So in this for this image um, there is a link below that says follow this link for a long description. And if I click on that link, it will bring me. Oh, <laughs> it will bring me to a long description and I can turn on the voice. Conflict styles diagram long description. A diagram with four quadrants depicting five conflict styles. The X axis depicts focus on relationships with a high focus on relationships on the right and a low focus on relationships on the left. The Y axis depicts focus on one's own agenda with a high focus on one's agenda at the top and a low focus on. I'll pause it there, but I can also uh, use the app reader to read the text continuously as it was just doing. Um, so that's great that it has a long description and I don't have to rely on my vision to read a picture that might be difficult for me um, to see. Also, lastly, what I'd like to point out, sometimes when images or when the font is small, as much as I magnify in, the font, the text becomes distorted. So I hope you can see here we have an image and even as I magnify in, I can see this Alberta and your photo here, but on the other side where it says name, this font is too small and therefore when I magnify it becomes distorted. So we just want to be mindful that we're using appropriate font sizes. But those are the main features of Zoom Text that I'm going to show today. So thank you for watching this video demonstration. All right, so that was a demonstration of the screen enhancement software called Zoom Text and what that looks and sounds like. So on next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of accessible and inaccessible communications. So as I mentioned earlier, I myself have a print disability and so um, and I have also encountered a lot of inaccessible communications in my life. And so what this really means to somebody is that you aren't accessing a lot of information that is out there. And we all know that social media um, is very important for communications. It's not just for community networking and socialization, but it's also for civic engagement, um, and also that it has the potential for conveying life-saving information in the case of emergencies. And when this information isn't accessible, it can really impact somebody's life. It can um, make it so that somebody does not have the information they need to stay safe or even to just like be involved in their community. So I have an example um, video, a screen recording that I did of an inaccessible social media post. So you can get an idea of what that looks and sounds like.
image. So in this post, there um, is text, there um, is an image, there's things happening in this image, but because this image is not accessible, it does not have alt text, which is something that I will talk about very shortly. All of that somebody who cannot see this image gets is image. This image might as well be blank or not even be there because it is conveying nothing. While most uh, many people who can see the image get information, they get information about the hotline that is there, etc. And so imagine that this is something that you encounter frequently on a daily basis and how disconnected you could feel from social media and how if this image was conveying um, emergency information, for instance, if it was um, talking about evacuations in the case of the wildfires last year, et cetera, if that information, all you get is image, what are you going to do in that situation? It can be very um, scary, very disconnecting. And so today, I'm, as I have mentioned, I will give you some tips on how to make your social media um, communications accessible so that this does not happen, so that your um, constituents, the citizens of the uh, municipalities in which you live, can have all of the information that you are sharing. So next slide, please. So the accessibility considerations that I'm going to cover today are alt text and image descriptions for images and videos, flat copy, font and color contrast, emojis, hashtags, fonts and styles, ASCII art, and formatting. I'm not going to give step-by-step -step instructions on how to enact these things because um, every social media platform, every um, scheduler, etc., has different ways of doing it. And But those um, steps are usually quite easy to locate online. Um, I'm just going to make you aware of these considerations so that you can then figure out how to enact them on your specific platforms. Um, while many of these considerations will focus on social media, um, most of these considerations also apply to many other types of communications, other platforms, including emails, newsletters, and documents. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so alt text. Um, on this slide, there is an image of um, a plain black background, and in the middle it has in capital letters, um, large white letters, it says image. And in the corner, there's a hashtag that says use, hashtag use alt text. And this image is credited to at Carolyn Conroy. And so what this is, is a visual depiction of what we saw earlier, that when an image does not have alt text, all a screen reader user will receive from that image is the word image. And that is not descriptive and is not helpful. So next slide, please. So what is alt text? Alt text is a concise, descriptive, and informative description of an image's key visual details. Alt text is not the same thing as an image caption. A caption supports an image. It often contains things like photo credits, while alt text is an actual stand-in for the image. It's what a screen reader user or an assistive technology user is getting in the place of the image. Captions usually rely on someone being able to see the image, while alt text is what people who cannot see the image at all receive. Next slide, please. So again, without alt text, all a screen reader will read is image. And because of this, when a screen reader user encounters an image that just says image, they have no idea whether this image is just to add um, decoration or just visual appeal or whether it is some crucial information um, such as an infographic or text um, conveying emergency information. You want to add alt text to all images. This includes uh, pictures, graphs, charts, maps, memes, GIFs, et cetera. Next slide, please. So on this slide, um, 
I have created a kind of fun, easy way to remember the four main components of what you need to include in your alt text. So um, there's an image of a cat on this slide. Um, she has long fur that is black, gray, white, uh, brown. Uh, she has a squished face as if she has run into something and her face just stuck that way. Um, she's sitting in a windowsill and she's looking up as though she is pondering something very deep. And the slide is asking, what would cats do? And the answer is cats would add alt text to all of their images because cats are vain creatures and they want everyone to be able to appreciate their beauty. So they would add alt text to their images. So in the question, what would cats do? The what stands for write helpful alt text, which is what you need to do for all of your images. And then cats stands for ca um, context, action, text, and setting, which are the four main things you need to include in your alt text. And on the next slide, I will get into what those actually look like. So for the do's for alt text, you want to state whether the image is um, a drawing, an infographic, a comic, a painting, a chart, etc., to give more context to the image description. Um, so you want to include the context. Why are you using this image? What is it doing for your post? And that is what you want to include in your description of the image. You want to describe the action of the image. What are the people doing in the image, the animals, what's happening in this image? You want to, um, ac action also includes things like facial expressions. Um, so for text, you want to include all of the text from the image in your alt text. And you want to describe the setting or the scene in sufficient detail. So anything in the background, anything like that, that is important to the context of your image. Uh, you want to include regular sentences and punctuation in your alt text. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the don'ts, the things you don't want to do in your alt text descriptions. You don't want to write image of. Um, earlier, I said you should include whether the image is a chart or a comic, etc., to give more context. Well, we already know that a screen reader will say the word image when it enc encounters an image, and it's the same if alt text is included as well. It'll say image and it'll read the alt text. So we already know it's an image. You don't need to include the word image. You don't want to include um, just a list of keywords. As I said earlier, you need to write in proper sentences so that the um, image, uh, the crucial image information from the image is conveyed. And you don't want to make your alt text very vague, such as saying event flyer, um, screenshot, etc., because this does not give very much information at all. What does the flyer include? What um, it might include the location and the time of the event that you're advertising. If you just say flyer, the person uh, reading it with a screen reader will have no idea about the details of the event, where to show up, when to show up, what the event is even about, etc. Um, you don't want to include any information that a sighted person can't gain from the image. So for instance, if you are showing an image of a house, um, you don't want to include in the alt text description the value of the house, unless that is something that a sighted person can also gain from the image. Um, you don't want to rely on AI generated alt text, which is something that many platforms offer. Um, and I will get a bit more into that later. Um, but those alt, um, AI alt text descriptions are often far too vague and often incorrect. So for instance, you uh, might generate an alt text description such as image may contain nature and outdoors, which is not descriptive at all. I've had um, AI alt text descriptions before of an, from an image of my dog, sitting in the backyard, say, you know, image may contain outdoors. And it doesn't even mention my dog at all. So 
while AI alt text descriptions might be a good place to start if you're having struggles writing alt text, you should not rely entirely on it because it's not going to give the information to your reader that you want them to have. Um, you don't want to put hyperlinks in your alt text unless that is the text that is in the photo because hyperlinks are not clickable in alt text. So they are um, not useful unless it's actual text that is being conveyed in the image. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some more alt text tips. So you might be a little concerned about writing alt text. Um, this can kind of seem a bit of a scary prospect to have to describe an image, but just imagine that you're describing this image to a friend over the phone. What information do you need to tell the person so that they understand what you're looking at? Alt text can have character and humor, but don't forget that um, its main purpose is to give the um, the main information that this image is conveying to a person who cannot see the image. Um, try to keep your descriptions concise, but the ultimate length of your alt text really depends on the complexity of the image itself. Two people looking at the same image will definitely have different alt text descriptions because though we try to make alt text as objective as possible, we each have our own experiences, we each have our own um, things that we focus on and think that is important. And so every alt text description of, this, of one image will be different. But also an image that is used in different locations will have different alt text even if it's the same writer because of the context. So for instance, um, as I said earlier about a, a image of a house, if you were including this um, image just as a um, visual appeal, you might just describe the house um, in very a very short sentence saying um, that it's a house and maybe a few details about it. But if this image was appearing on a website about um, like horticulture um, from a gardening center, etc., they might focus more on the flowers outside the house. And if this image was appearing on like a realtor website, a realty website, then um, the actual like structure of the house might be described more, um, et cetera, whether it's like two stories or whatever that is important to that image. Um, alt text is an art and it may take a while for you to feel comfortable or confident in um, doing it. But Remember that some alt text is always better than no alt text. Some um, indication of what this image is, is far better than just hearing the word image. Uh, next slide, please. So I have some alt text examples that I will show you to give you a bit of a better understanding of what alt text actually sounds like. And so the first example is from the government of Alberta. Uh, um, X account and you will hear what it sounds like. Image. Text reads, snowfall warning. A row of cars stopped in traffic. Heavy snow is falling and the road is covered in snow. The white Alberta logo is on the bottom right corner. So in this image we get the text uh, we get the action of the cars we get the setting and also we get a description um, of that the logo is in the corner it doesn't go into great detail about the logo but that's not um, the main focus of this image so just saying that's the government of alberta logo is totally fine um, and so the next image is also from the government of alberta x account Image. Text reads helping children plan for emergencies. Parents with two young children are sitting on a sectional sofa. They are looking at a map on the coffee table and the father is pointing to a spot highlighted. Emergency supplies, such as canned food, water bottles, a flashlight, rope, 
Phone charger and batteries are also on the coffee table. So that's a really good example of alt text describing what is appearing in this image, including the supplies that are on the table. Um, so the next two examples that I have are from last year's um, 2023's Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, they are examples of from two different teams that are playing uh, the same kind of post showing uh, game day details of where to find the games. Um, and the first alt text example is a good example of what you should include in such an um, images alt text. Image. White graphic featuring two photos of Florida Panthers Captain Alexander Barkov. The words Game 2 are written in red with a matchup, Panthers at Carolina Hurricanes and the time, 8 p.m. ET and tune in info, TNT, 560 WQAM above and below the matchup. This is Game 2 of the 2023 Eastern Conference Final. So, in this graphic, the alt text writer has highlighted the important information, the text from the image, and also described the um, other things that are occurring in this image as well. And let's see the other example of um, less well uh, done alt text and compare the two. Image graphic promoting tonight's game information. So while this image does have alt text, it is not describing anything that is going on in the picture, um, like the previous one. So it doesn't have the information about the game. It doesn't actually describe what is in the image. And so this alt text is not as helpful as the other one. OK, so let's move on to talk about image descriptions. So to be even more accessible, an image, or sorry, a post containing an image should contain an image description as well as alt text. So image descriptions appear in the body of your post and are visible to everyone, while alt text is connected in the um, coding of the image and sighted people cannot um, see that text. There are some exceptions to this that I will talk a bit about later. Um, image descriptions follow the exact same um, guidelines as alt text, but they can be even more descriptive than alt text because of greater character counts in the body of posts. Um, next slide, slide please. So in order to identify your image description, you want to start um, your description with the words image description, just so that people know um, what it is. And you don't need to include image descriptions on posts uh, on platforms where alt text is visible to cited people. So this includes Twitter and Blue Sky. I will show an example a bit later of what this looks like, but on um, on X or Twitter, um, there is an alt badge in the corner of images that contain alt text that you can click on so that you can visually see the alt text that a screen reader is reading. Um, image descriptions in the bodies of your posts can also help with post schedulers that don't allow for including alt text. Next slide, please. So alt text and and video descriptions. So there are two main ways of making video content, content accessible for those who cannot see it. So you can either add spoken descriptions to the video um, during the video's production. So for instance, if this is um, a Instagram video of a person, um, preparing a dish, cooking a dish, they might describe what they're doing while they're doing it, while they're cracking the eggs, etc. They might just say what they're doing. Or the audio descriptions can be added in afterwards on a separate audio track that fills in the, um, when there's gaps in the dialogue, then it will describe what is happening. 
However, this, um, this form of creating audio descriptions can be quite time consuming, can be expensive if it's outsourced to another company. Um, you might be familiar with these types of audio descriptions from um, TV shows, etc. You might see the little um, ad at the beginning of TV shows saying that it's described for the visually impaired and you have to turn it on on a setting on on the secondary audio programming channel. And um, so these are quite common on TV shows and um, on streaming services. Um, but if you can't do this, another way of in making video content accessible for those who can't see it is to offer a written description of the action of a kind of video as a kind of video alt text. And I have an example of this, a very short video um, from X. And the creator has written a short alt text description of what happens in this video. So we'll see how, what that looks and sounds like. My cat trap worked. Alt text, video panning over a long cardboard box from a closed end to an open end. The camera flips upside down at the open end to show a Siamese mixed cat sitting inside the box. Video. Video. Doctor, Alexis M. So without that alt text description in the body of the post, somebody who cannot see that video would have very little idea of what is happening in that video itself. So this video is far more accessible now with that alt text description. Okay, so moving on from alt text, on the next slide, I will talk about flat copy. And so when text is captured within an image, it is called flat copy. So this often occurs when somebody writes uh, text in a word processor, a notepad, et cetera, takes a screenshot and then posts that image to um, social media or includes it in the body of an email, et cetera. Now the text in these images is not readable with a screen reader and it is um, and it can't be magnified using pinch to zoom, which um, some people who have low vision rely on. Um, you can uh, identify flat copy when you cannot select it with a cursor. So what you need to do in these situations, if you need to include an image with text, you need to type out all of the text in that image into the alt text field. If you run out of characters in the alt text field, add the text to a series of replies to your post. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so font and color contrast for visuals. So though you have very little control over the text, what the text looks like in your posts, you have a lot of control over the visuals that you create and then post. And so you want to always consider the size and style of the font you use and the color contrast. So you want to have a minimum of a 12 point sans serif font. Um, in your creations. And so sans serif fonts are those fonts that do not include serifs, which are those um, like decorative flourishes on characters that make them a bit more difficult to read. Um, so 12 point, but larger is always better. Um, the contrast between the foreground font and the background color needs to be enough that the font is clearly legible. So that means uh, when we talk about color contrast, it is written in ratios. So you want to have a three to one contrast for 18 point font and above and a 4.5 to one contrast for 17 point font and below. And so you always want to use a color contrast checker to check the color contrast of any combination of colors apart from black on white or white on black, etc. And uh, Kim is going to do a little bit of a demonstration here of the WebAIM color contrast checker. Awesome, thank you. Um, yes, so <clears throat> again, we always want to check our color contrast if we're using 
any color for our fonts other than black on white or white on black. And so I've got this sample document um, up on my computer here, and we're going to test actually this title, the Appointment to Library System Board's title. It's in this very lovely green color. I'm going to show you how to do this in, in a document, and then we can talk about um, how to do this maybe on a website as well or in your social media posts. So um, I'm going to first find the color code. I'm going to highlight, oops, to highlight the text and then I'm going to go over to the font section and so we're working in word here um, and I'm going to select font color I'm going to go to more colors and this is where I'm going to find the different color codes so I'm going to use the RGB the red green blue code there are other codes to get your um, you can also use the hex code to get your color uh, but this one is 146 208 80 146 208 80 and I'm going to plug that into the web aim contrast checker and I'll show you that. So I'm going to plug it in first before I forget the code 146 208 80 and we'll talk about it. Um, so yes, the this is web aim. It's a really great resource. They have all kinds of accessibility um, resources, I guess. <laughs> it's a great website. Um, and on their contrast checker, they've got a place where you can plug in the foreground color and the background color. So the foreground color is that green. I plugged in the code and the background color in our document was white and it will measure the contrast. Those, those contrast ratios that Kel was mentioning. Um, it will measure to see if there's sufficient contrast and if there isn't, it will be unreadable for some people. So we can see with this contrast, um, it's, it's insufficient for every level of compliance with WCAG. And WCAG is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. There's uh, three different levels of compliance with WCAG, A, AA, AAA. Um, and here, this, this level of contrast is actually insufficient for any of them. And WCAG um, is what web developers use to make sure that their websites are accessible. Uh, okay, so for, for this particular color, we can actually use a slider bar to move the foreground color around and increase the contrast ratio. And now we can see that it's starting to pass different levels of WCAG compliance. So depending on the size of the text um, and what level of compliance you're aiming for, most web developers aim for AA compliance when they're making sure that their websites are accessible. Um, so depending on what you are doing, you can uh, move the slider around and then you get the new color code so we can get the new RGB. You can also, if you select the little drop down menu here, there are the other codes. So there, there, there's also the hex code depending on what your preference for working with is. Um, if you are working with say a social media post or a website um, and you can't, can't easily find the uh, color code, you can also use this little dropper feature. So I've selected the foreground color. There's this dropper and it actually, now you have this dropper and you can select different colors on your website or on your, on your post. And that I think is all for color contrast. I'll turn it back to you, Kel. Thanks Kim for giving that demonstration of color contrast checker. Okay, so I have, going to move on to give some specific tips for the kind of big three social media platforms. So that is Facebook, Instagram, and X. And so first up we have Facebook with, and the main tips we have for Facebook is to not rely on the auto-generated alt text. As I talked about earlier, this is usually too vague and not helpful. Uh, you only have 100 characters on Facebook for your alt text, so you want to be as concise as possible. And you want to add alt text to every image in a post and not just, you know, the first one. Facebook stories are not accessible at all for screen reading technologies. So if you put important information in a Facebook story, you need to also create a regular Facebook post with that information so it's disseminated to everyone. You can edit alt text for images that you've already posted, which is awesome. So if you forget to add alt text to an image, you can just edit it. So you don't have to like take it down and re-upload it. You can just edit it and save it. And there you go. There's your alt text. 
Um, you also want to add image descriptions in the body of your post, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Facebook is one of the platforms where alt text is not visually um, accessible for sighted people, so you want to also have an image description in the body of your post. Um, next slide, please. Um, Instagram. So Instagram is very similar to Facebook. They're owned by the same company and their um, kind of tips are very similar. So again, don't rely on the auto-generated alt text. You also only have 100 characters for your alt text to so be concise. Add um, alt text to every image in a carousel. And again, you can also edit the alt text for images that are already posted. So that is awesome. Um, you want to add an dis image description to the captions of your post, and stories are not accessible. So if you post important information in a story, you need to also add a regular Instagram post with that information. And also add descriptions of your reels to the captions for those reels. And this goes for Facebook as well, but if you're sharing somebody's post, um, you want to add an image description to your shared post as well, um, because you might not be aware if they have alt text already. So it's just good practice to describe what you are sharing as well. So everyone has access to that. Uh, next slide, please. So X or Twitter um, offers 1000 characters for your alt text. So that's great. You have a lot more room to play around with for your alt text, but you also still want to be concise. You don't need to use all 1000 characters if you don't have to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, X places an alt badge in the corner of images that contain alt text. So you can click on that alt badge and then you can visually see the alt text of the image. The unfortunate thing, um, is though that you cannot edit the alt text once a post has already been shared. So either repost your image with the alt text or add a reply to that post with your alt text description. Um, if you share GIFs, make sure you add alt text to those posts as well to the file um, GIF file, because um, if you don't, all a screen reader user will read is the title of that file, which is often not descriptive at all. Um, and if you're retweeting a post that uh, doesn't have alt text, if the image doesn't have that little alt badge in the corner, um, either add alt text in your post or take a screenshot of the post and add alt text. Uh, next slide, please. So I have a couple um, supplemental images here from um, X or Twitter so that you can see kind of what I was talking about. So um, one image is a screenshot from a post on Twitter or X from the We Rate Dogs account. The post image shows two dogs on a beach and there is an alt badge in the bottom left hand corner um, of the photo that indicates there is an alt text description available that you could click on and read. And also I have an image here of um, a screenshot from the accessibility settings of the X application showing the receive image description reminder option near the bottom of the accessibility settings. And so this is really cool. Um, this is something that I think all platforms should have. Um, but what this does is if you have this setting turned on, and you go to post an image without adding, adding alt text, it will remind you to add alt text to your image. So you, um, it offers just a little bit more of a reminder to um, include these accessibility considerations. So I recommend turning that on as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about email. And so a lot of communications also go out through email and not just social media. And so a lot of the things I've already talked about today are also important for emails. So that includes adding alt text to all of your images in your emails, which also includes any images in your signature. A lot of people forget about their signatures, and that's also important. Um, consider typing out information instead of adding an image to your email of text. This makes it more accessible for a screen reader and also means that you don't have to retype that text out anyway in the alt text of your image. 
you want to consider font style and color contrast. As Kim demonstrated earlier, you can um, use WebAIM contrast checker to check the contrast of the text in your emails as well. You want to embed hyperlinks in descriptive text. And so this, what this means is you um, don't just put the URL, the HTTP goal slash slash www.examplewebsite.com. Um, and you don't just call that link something like click here. You want to make sure that that link has a title that makes sense out of context. So if you took all of the surrounding text out of the post and just look at the link, you could tell what that link is going to lead you to. So why this is important is because um, a lot of screen readers can extract a link, a list of links from uh, an email or website or document, etc. And a lot of people use this functionality to navigate to links quicker. And if all you're getting is a bunch of URLs or a bunch of click here, click here, click here, you might not know what that link is actually going to take you to. Um, you want to use headings, and that is under styles in Outlook. If you use Outlook, or you can code them in H with HTML in your newsletters, etc. But you want to use headings to uh, demo demark different sections of your email. So what we a lot of people do is put titles of sections um, in bigger font, use bold or italics, et cetera, to make those headings stand out so that visually you can scan for the different sections of your email or your document, et cetera. But if you actually use the styles to make your headings, then that adds markup to your emails or documents or websites, et cetera, that screen readers and other assistive technologies can use to navigate quickly. Otherwise, um, assistive technology users may have to read the entire thing to find what they are actually looking for instead of being able to scan. Um, next slide, please. So emojis. We, you want to avoid an excessive use of emojis because while emojis have descriptions that screen readers read automatically, having a long string of emojis results in a lot of spoken words that a person has to listen to. So I have an example here on the screen of an emoji and this smiling face. Um, what a screen reader reads is smiling face with open mouth and smiling eyes emoji. And so imagine if there were, you know, 10 of those in a row, it'd be, it'd take up a lot of time to listen to and that can get very repetitive and redundant. Um, so you want to avoid using emojis as bullet points. And if a trend requires a lot of emojis in a row, um, for example, a few years ago, there was that red flag meme on Twitter. Um, it's best to write out all of those emojis in a document, take a screenshot and post that with alt text instead of having, you know, 240, 280 um, smiling faces or red flag emojis, etc. Uh, next slide, please. So hashtags, you want to always write your hashtags in Pascal case. And what Pascal case is, is that um, you capitalize every word within a hashtag. So for example, I have a hashtag here that is hashtag best training ever. And I have capitalized the B, the T and the E in best training ever. Um, and so without capitals, a screen reader reads a hashtag as one word, one, well, it tries to read it as one long word, and this can often become very confusing and it is incomprehensible. So for example, that hashtag best training ever, if I didn't have the capitals in it, it sounds like best training ever. It, yeah, doesn't make sense. <laughs> so with capitals delineating the words, my screen reader reads that hashtag as best training ever. It will read your hashtag correctly. And this is also just good common sense for everyone. It makes it easier for people who can see to read hashtags as well. And one more comment about hashtags on Instagram. You want to put your hashtag clouds in the first comment of your post instead of the body of your post, because for a screen reader user or any assistive technology user, it can be difficult to navigate through a long stream of string of hashtags. Um, so you want to put them in a place that can be skipped over. 
Uh, next slide, please. OK, so unique fonts and styles. Um, never use unique fonts or styles copied from third party sites. And what I mean by this is when um, many people will take a chunk of text and they will go to a third party website that converts it into a stylized font. They put the text in a box and convert it to whatever font style they want. They copy that back into their social media and then it looks you know, bold or italics, italicized, etc. However, these uh, fonts do not read correctly with a screen reader and are pretty much incomprehensible. They're also really difficult for some people with low vision or other print disabilities to decipher. So I have an example here and you can hear um, what this sounds like. Unpronounceable, mathematical sans serif bold italic capital T, mathematical sans serif bold italic small h, Mathematical sans serif bold italic small one, mathematical sans serif bold italic small s, mathematical sans serif bold italic small one, mathematical sans serif bold italic small s, mathematical sans serif bold italic small n, mathematical sans serif bold italic small o, okay, mathematical sans serif bold italic small t. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so that is really, really hard to listen to. So that was um, four words. Um, this is not accessible. We didn't listen to the whole thing, um, but because it is really hard to listen to. Um, but it just listening to it, you could. It was very difficult to tell what that was even trying to say. There's no spaces between the words. The um, characters were not being read correctly. There were, um, you know, saying one instead of I and. Um, it just is so hard to listen to, and so I don't recommend using this um, kind of stylized text at all in your posts. Uh, next slide, please. OK, ASCII art. Um, you probably don't um, have this on your um, social media accounts, but just in case so you can be aware, um, you want to avoid using characters and symbols to create art or images. Um, this is known as ASCII art and these images are read one symbol at a time by a screen reader and screen reader users cannot get an overall understanding of what you were trying to convey with these images. It's just a string of nonsense. Um, if you need to create an image in this way, it's best if you create it in a document, take a screenshot and then add all text describing it. Uh, next slide, please. OK, unique formatting. So don't add um, tabs or spaces to uh, attempt to create columns within your posts. Screen readers won't recognize this um, visual layout that you have created, and it will read and they'll read them the same way they read every other post. So left um, in English, you know, left, right, top to bottom. And so the post will be read out of order and it'll be very confusing. Always format your posts in a single column. And this is just, you know, common sense advice that you probably already know, but whenever possible, avoid long blocks of text. Instead, break up your posts into smaller paragraphs. This is easier for uh, many people with print disabilities to read. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so some other accessibility tips. Always include captions with your video content. Um, most platforms allow you to add automatic captions to your videos, which is awesome, but you should usually edit those for clarity whenever you can, because those captions can sometimes be wrong. Um, always include transcripts of your audio content for those who um, are deaf or hard of hearing may have or you know even those who may be in a loud environment and can't actually listen having an audio transcript of that information is far more accessible um avoid flashing or strobing gifs or other video content wherever possible i'm sure most people know this now but those kind of flashing gifs or content can induce seizures in some people with um, epilepsy. Um, so 
avoid them wherever possible, but if you need to link to a video that it contains such content, add a warning to your post that it contains flashing or strobing content so people can be aware and can avoid that content if they need to. Um, next slide, please. OK, so accessibility beyond social media. You want to take these practices beyond your social media because um, all of your content, all of your social media, or, uh, your website, your document, your emails, etc., can be made accessible in many of the same ways, as I mentioned earlier, with email. So you want to add alt text to your images on your website, in your documents, in your presentations, etc. Um, always consider your font size and color contrast within your emails, websites, documents, presentations, etc. Whenever possible, add captions to all of your video content, no matter where it appears. Um, look at the current uh, WCAG guidelines. As Kim mentioned earlier, WCAG stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I believe they're on WCAG version 2.2 now, and you can look at those guidelines for your web content. And also many of those standards also apply to other places. Um, it is always better to consider accessibility from the beginning of a project than to add it in later. So within accessibility spaces, we kind of have an analogy and metaphor that we use um, to describe this. So if you're baking blueberry muffins, it is far easier to add the blueberries in before you bake them rather than trying to mush them into your muffins after they have already been baked and are cooling. Um, that will just create a mess and is far harder. So always when you're sitting down to create a document or redesigning your website or writing an email, newsletter, et cetera, think about accessibility from the beginning, how you can format this um, communication in order to be accessible instead of writing the whole thing out, adding your graphics, and then going, oh, no, I need to make this accessible at the end because that will take far more time and it'll be a lot harder to deal with uh, for you. Um, so next slide, please. So we've reached the end of this presentation on accessible communications. My email is on the slide here. It is Kel, K -E -L, dot banks. B-A-N-K-S at gov, G-O-V dot A-B dot C-A. And feel free to email me with any questions you may have about this presentation. Um, if you have any questions about accessible communications, feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for watching this session today. Thank you.